This video is brought to you by Raycon earbuds with a great sound at a great price. You can check them out at buyraycon.com forward slash geographics. More on them in a bit. It is the site of history's unlikeliest revolution. In the early hours of June 28, 1969, a routine police raid at the Stonewall Inn gave way to an uprising the likes of which New York had never seen. Fed up with decades of mounting harassment, the LGBT community in Greenwich Village rioted, bricks were thrown, buildings were set ablaze, and in the midst of this social inferno, a new kind of solidarity was born. In the aftermath of Stonewall, gay people started organizing for the first time. Within a month, they'd staged a mass protest in New York. Within a year, the first Pride marches had defiantly begun. It was the beginning of a journey that ultimately led to achievements like gay marriage, and it all started here, one hot, muggy night five decades ago. At least, that's the popular version of the story, but go digging into the details and you discover the real tale of the Stonewall Inn is far more complex, far more confusing, and far more interesting than you probably know. Today, Geographics is delving deep into America's recent history and uncovering the story of a social revolution. The story of the Stonewall Inn technically starts in 1966, when a New York mobster bought the building and decided he could make easy money by turning it into a gay bar. We say technically because the real story doesn't have an easily defined beginning. And its setting isn't just New York, although that will be the focus of this video. The name of that story? Well, that's the persecution of LGBT Americans. Like many other minorities, queer people were part of the American story from day one. Walt Whitman, for example, was probably bisexual. But come the 1960s, the LGBT community was still living in the shadows, even as civil rights in general were growing. Illinois was the only state where two consenting men having sex wasn't mega illegal. In California, anyone caught in a gay bar could be locked away in a mental institution for the rest of their lives. There were even seven states where having private, consexual sex with a partner of your own gender could result in you being legally castrated. The 1960s may be remembered today as the decade of free love, but love for gay, lesbian, bisexual, and trans people still came at a hefty price. Nowhere was this more evidence than in New York City. Now, you might assume the Big Apple was a relatively tolerant place. After all, this is where the East Village is located in the 1960s, possibly the gayest place on Earth. But just because lots of queer people lived in the city doesn't mean the city wanted them. Just check this list of things NYC outlawed. Kissing someone of the same gender, dancing with someone of the same gender, wearing fewer than three items of gender-appropriate clothing, selling or buying alcohol as a gay person, and gathering in a group that wasn't predominantly straight. With these rules enforced by undercover officers, daily life for LGBT New Yorkers was a roller coaster where any moment could bring arrest, the loss of their career, and public humiliation. And that wasn't even the worst possible outcome. Gay bashing was still a very real threat. Just weeks before the Stonewall riots, the NYPD pulled the body of a murdered gay man from Hudson Bay. So, yes, being queer in 1960s NYC was not a barrel of laughs. With the city stamping down on anything pink and fabulous, most non-closeted people were forced to stay on the fringes of society. In 1960s New York, that meant being forced into the arms of the Mafia. Macho, murderous psychopaths and a persecuted gay minority might sound like a bit of a weird combination, but it actually made perfect sense. While the mob was full of guys who loved toxic masculinity, it was also full of guys who loved easy money. And what could be easier money than having a monopoly on the only safe spaces LGBT people could congregate? Oh sure, there were attempts to divorce gay bars from criminality. In 1966, the Madachine Society had even managed to get the ban on serving alcohol to gay people overturned, yet City City Hall had responded by simply outlawing other aspects of LGBT life, like holding hands with a partner, forcing anyone but the most deeply closeted to stay drinking in their mafia-run holes. Okay, so that's the world the Stonewall Inn existed in. One where being queer meant living on the margins, and your only allies were vicious mobsters who wanted to bleed you dry. Now that we've got a handle on that, it's time to talk about the bar itself.
You're a human being, alive and interested in history in the 2020s. You've almost certainly heard about the Stonewall Inn. In all likelihood, you have an image in your head of a cozy little bar beloved by the gay community. Well, you can eject that myth from your cranium right now. The real Stonewall Inn was a dump, the sort of crappy, sketchy bar no one would drink in if they had literally anywhere else to go. Bought in 1966 by a mobster named Fat Tony, yep, just like in The Simpsons, the Stonewall was a restaurant that had been damaged in a fire. Fat Tony didn't even bother to spiff it up before reopening. He simply slapped some black paint over the windows, called it a gay bar, and started charging extortionate amounts to get in. It was such a half-assed effort that the mobster claimed he made all his money back before midnight on the opening night. While that was likely a joke, what was true was that Fat Tony skimped on just about everything. There was no running water at the bar, so glasses were just rinsed in a dirty bowl. On the other hand, the toilets had a surplus of water. Nearly every night, they overflowed, sometimes returning people's let's just call them deposits. There was no fire exit, the drinks were watered down, and the whole place was managed by a dude nicknamed The Skull, because that's exactly where he'd put a bullet if you looked at him wrong. In short, the historical Stonewall was vile, which begs the question, well, why did anyone go there? And, well, we know what you're thinking now, and no, it wasn't the only gay bar in the city or even in the village. There were several nearby, including one just up the road that was nicer in every respect. However, the Stonewall did have something no other gay club in New York could boast. And that was a dance floor. Remember how we said that dancing with someone of the same gender was way illegal in 1960s New York? Well, it was so illegal that even the mafia didn't want the hassle of it happening in their bars, so they didn't install any dance floors. But when Fat Tony came to open the stone wall, he seems to have decided, well, what the hell, let's do it. Maybe it was a plan for stealing business off other gay bars. Maybe it was simply easier than coming up with an alternative use for all that floor space. Whatever the reason, the Stonewall soon became notorious as the only place in New York where you could dance with your partner without fear of arrest, mostly thanks to Fat Tony bribing the crap out of the police. The Stonewall always seemed to know when a raid was coming. Bartenders got adept at flicking on the lights, killing the music, and getting everyone off the dance floor before the first cop car even pulled up. By the time the Stonewall reached its second year of operation, the Skull was even directing when the police conducted their raids, meaning the Stonewall only ever got hit during off-peak hours. So imagine for a moment that you're a gay or a bi or a trans person living in 1960s New York, a place where you're always watching over your shoulder for the blue lights of a cop car. Wouldn't you be willing to put up with all of the hideousness that we've just described in return for knowing that you were, for once, in a space that was truly safe. So the Stonewall flourished, eventually becoming perhaps the biggest gay bar in the United States. No matter that the Skull would sometimes blackmail wealthier clients, no matter that the doorman might turn you away due to your skin color, depending if they felt the clientele was looking too black or too white on that particular night. Given all this, the Stonewall was still an oasis, a scuzzy fire trap of an oasis. But in this time, and in this place, that still counted for something. Sadly for New York's gay community, even this modest safe space was about to get cruelly snatched away. Now, fortunately, we live in a very different world today, where in most places of the world, anyone can enjoy music and dance without oppression. And if you enjoy music, well, that brings me to today's sponsor, Raycon. Raycon make great earbuds with great sounds and affordable price point. They're all about innovative earbud designs at prices that do not break the bank. Now, they sent me this pair of everyday E25 earbuds. I've been using them for a couple of weeks now, and basically, they just fit really nicely in the ear. You just pop them in like this. They also deliver six hours of playtime. And don't be thinking, oh, that's six hours of playtime once you, you know, you recharge them in the case. No, no, no. Six hours of playtime. And then you put them in this box and they will recharge four more times, which is pretty fantastic. So overall, you're getting about 24 hours of playtime, which is uh, pretty exceptional, really. Now, I've used cheap earbuds. I've used expensive earbuds. But what Raycon do is they offer a premium experience at about half the price of premium wireless earbuds. And... Honestly, these things are like 80 bucks, and you get 15% off if you use my link. And I would say that's even more than half the price of other premium wireless earbuds. Certainly half the price of other premium wireless earbuds that I've used. So just go to buyraycon.com forward slash geographics. You'll get 15% off your order. And let's get back to today's video.
The month leading to the Stonewall Riots felt like any other June in NYC, hot, muggy, and ordinary. It would only be in retrospect that people were able to look back and pinpoint those moments, those muted signs that said something's gonna happen. An early tremor came in the form of increasing police rage, resulting in up to 100 LGBT people being arrested every single week. Not long after, a vigilante group in Queens began cornering queer men in a popular gay park and threatening to beat them half to death if they didn't leave. When that didn't work, they chopped all the trees and bushes down, leaving the city's LGBT minority with one less place to hide. Come the third week of June, even Fat Tony's bribes couldn't keep his clientele safe. On June the 23rd, the Stonewall Inn was raided for the first time. The man behind the raid was Deputy Inspector Seymour Pine, a guy with an action movie resume that included fighting in World War II and literally writing the military's book on hand-to-hand -hand combat. Now here he was, busting mafia-owned bars in the Big Apple and arresting gay people. Today, Inspector Pine often gets cast as the villain in histories of Stonewall. But real life is never quite so black and white, and Pine didn't hit the Stonewall twice purely out of homophobia. It was actually the Skull who apparently pushed him to do it. During the 29th of June raid, the mafioso cheerfully told Pine, well, we'll be open again tomorrow. When Fat Tony's bribes ensured that's exactly what happened, Pine seems to have decided to shut down this place once and for all. And the last notable thing to happen that June was the funeral of Judy Garland. The Miss Garland's funeral triggered the riots is almost as famous today for being debunked every Pride Month as it is for people actually believing it. Regardless, we'll just categorically state it here so we can move on with the story. No, the funeral of Judy Garland didn't make the gays so emotional that they rioted. That's what we at Geographics like to call a really stupid theory. As night fell on Friday the 27th of June, the Stonewall Inn began to fill up, as it did every Friday. There were the straight-acting professionals, the 18-year-old gay street kids who'd made their way to the village after their parents threw them out. There were the drag queens, the trans women, the lesbians who proudly called themselves butch. They were black and white, closeted and out. Most were young, 18 or early 20s. But there were a couple of clients who stood out if you knew what to look for. A couple of women who seemed unnaturally observant, like they were trying to memorize faces. These were the undercover cops Inspector Pine had sent in ahead of the raid. As the two policewomen waited inside, a larger group was gathering in the shadows of Christopher Park right across from the Stonewall. Pine's plan that evening was simple. The Stonewall advertised itself as a bottle bar, meaning patrons brought their own booze and paid a cover charge. But the inspector knew that the Skull was selling alcohol in there without a license. He intended to go in, chase the gays out, then physically smash up the bar with a fire axe. You can tell the Skull had got to Pine. In all his other raids, he'd never carried out one like this before. One that was so well planned and took place so late at night. Finally, as the clock ticked 1.28 a.m. on Saturday, June the 28th, 1969, Pine gave the signal. Seven officers converged on the entrance, ready to smash this place once and for all. As Pine pushed open the door and stepped into the first room, hollering that this place was getting shut down, he couldn't possibly have known what was about to happen, what spark was about to be lit. By the time dawn rose, Inspector Pine would no longer be a mere policeman. He'd be a scared man cowering at the very epicenter of history. In a typical raid, the police only detained two types of people, the bar staff and those breaking that dumb three articles of gender-appropriate clothing law. The vast majority of patrons would be given a stern talking to and then released, usually slipping away into the night. But this wasn't a typical raid. For one thing, it was taking place during a time of heightened tensions between police and the gay community. For another, it was taking place at a time when most people in the Stonewall were absolutely steaming drunk. Rather than disperse, the patrons started to congregate in Christopher Park. As the cops released more and more people, the crowd grew until it was maybe 150 strong. Tanked up like that, the patrons started taunting the police. They cheered whenever anyone else got released from the bar. At first, it was just fooling around, a way of thumbing their noses at the cops who kept harassing their community. But then the atmosphere began to change. Rumors swelled that the police were beating up the cross-dressers that they'd arrested. As the moods turned darker, the cops fanned the flames by shoving some of the Stonewall's patrons, eliciting shouts and boos. By now, the crowd had swollen with people from nearby bars, including a number of non-LGBT people who were just there to antagonize the cops. At one point, a cross-dresser started hitting a cop with a handbag, the first sign of violence that evening. But the real ignition point came in the form of a single woman. In the early hours, the cops arrested a lesbian who had been at the bar. Instead of going quietly, she put up a fight, kicking with such ferocity that she managed to break back out of the car 
that she'd been locked into. To this day, the woman's identity remains an open question. Wikipedia will tell you that it was Storm Delavery, but every serious history we checked for this video is clear that the woman has never been identified for certain. What is certain is the effect that she had on the crowd. As the woman fought the police, the crowd's mood turned ugly. Coins were thrown at the cop car, clanging off the rooftop like metal raindrops. When a paddy wagon pulled up, the cops became empty beer cans. At that moment, the butch woman who had been rearrested kicked her way out of the cop car all over again. Why don't you guys do something? She yelled at the crowd. And well, they did. What followed wasn't a crowd reacting to a scene before it. It was an explosion of pent-up energy, a release of decades of bottled-up emotion. Like an enraged ocean, the crowd swept forward. They started rocking the paddy wagon, trying to tip it over. As the terrified cops staggered back, missiles started raining down. Glass, cobblestones, bricks. Today, who threw the first brick at Stonewall has become an unlikely flashpoint. Many websites will say with 100% certainty that it was Sylvia Rivera or Marsha P. Johnson, two trans women who were present that night. As with the idea that it was the biracial Storm de Lavery who started the riot, there's something nice in this telling. The vision it creates of a pivotal moment in LGBT history where trans people and people of color are front and center. But nice isn't the same as historically accurate, and the historical consensus is well, that there is no consensus. Maybe a trans woman really did throw the first brick. Maybe no bricks were thrown at all. Regardless of who threw what, the cops were quickly overwhelmed. Under a hail of garbage cans and bits of glass, they retreated inside the stone wall and barricaded the door. Maybe they hoped the rioters would disperse. If so, it was a dumb hope. New York's cops had just lit the fuse on a gigantic bomb of smoldering resentment, and the coming explosion was going to blow away everything. One cool aspect of the Stonewall riots, or uprising, or whatever you want to call the events of that hot June night is just how much fun some of the participants seemed to be having. There was the raquette star kick line of young men in drag who danced before the cops singing, We are the village girls, we wear our hair in curls, we wear our sweaters tight, we give the guys a fright. And there were also other far less family-friendly lyrics. Other participants recall the night of energy and freedom, of feeling like they could stand up and scream, I'm gay, at the top of their lungs. Two little words which would have been unthinkable only hours before. Yes, the events of that night were violent. Yes, they were a reaction to some truly awful oppression. But we shouldn't forget that for many of the participants, they were also liberating. After the cops were driven inside the stone wall, the uprising kicked into high gear. People tore up parking meters and used them as battering rams, trying to break inside. Others tried to set the building on fire, squirting lighter fluid through the windows. Incidentally, this is the reason why many prefer the wording Stonewall Uprising to Stonewall Riots. It puts the violence in a civil rights context, as a reaction to state oppression rather than just a drunk crowd trying to scare some cops. But make no mistake, uprising or riot, the cops inside the Stonewall were getting jumpy. As you may remember, Fat Tony had never installed a fire exit, and now the building was literally on fire, things were getting dangerous. But to Inspector Pine's credit, he resisted giving the order to shoot. One reporter who managed to get inside later wrote that Pine had gravely told his men, "'Anybody who fires their gun without me saying fire is going to be in big, big trouble. You'll be walking the loneliest beat on Staten Island for the rest of your career.'" Had Pine not been so level-headed, we could just as easily now be talking about the Stonewall Massacre. Thankfully, the cops listened to their boss, and Pine's nerve held till backup arrived. Although the squad was rescued from inside the burning building, the action wasn't over yet. Back outside, Pine gave the order to clear the street, resulting in pitched running battles between the crowd and the cops that lasted until dawn. There were up to a dozen retreats by the rioters who took advantage of the weird street layout of the village to keep circling around the cops and attacking again. Eventually, though, the carnage ended. By dawn, Christopher Street was in ruins, with cars overturned, smashed glass sprinkled across the pavements, and trash cans on fire. But even though the original Stonewall crowd was successfully dispersed, it was not the end. The very next day, the skull defiantly reopened the Stonewall Inn. It was just the first in a coming cascade of civil disobedience. That same Saturday, gay people, allies, and rubberneckers from across NYC descended on Christopher Street. Same-sex couples defiantly held hands, kissed in public, danced together. 
For many, it was likely the first time they'd ever seen so many other LGBT people in one space. Likely, it was the first time they'd realized how numerous they were. The evening ended with the cops tear-gassing the crowds, but not before hundreds gathered and set up a chant, one which would reverberate through history. Gay power. It was the beginning of a revolution. <laughs> It's somewhat in vogue to compare the Stonewall Uprising to the fall of the Bastille, a single event that unleashed a revolution. But a more apt revolutionary comparison might be the three glorious days of 1830, when a spontaneous uprising in Paris managed to overturn the entire French social order. The uprising's profound social power was already visible when the gay poet Allen Ginsberg visited on the Sunday. Surprised to see so many queer couples holding hands or making out, he told a reporter, We are one of the largest minorities in the country. It's about time we did something to assert ourselves. Of course, that's not to say life for LGBT New York has changed overnight. Even the radical left media painted the events as a faintly comical temper tantrum thrown by a handful of fags. Their word, not ours. In a way, it was the most helpful response possible. Those same fags read what these ignoramuses were writing and decided to show them what this movement really meant. The first march took place on July the 27th, 1969, exactly one month after Inspector Pine's raid on the Stonewall. Several hundred LGBT people paraded through NYC, the biggest such crowd the US had likely ever seen. Organizing this march created a network of activists galvanized by events such as another police raid on a gay bar that resulted in a man falling to his death. Exactly one year after the events at the Stonewall, the first gay pride marches were held simultaneously in New York, Chicago, San Francisco, and LA. The parade in New York was so big that it stretched for 15 blocks. Although the activists marching in 1970 already felt they were living in a much, much more open world than the one that existed in June of 1969, there was still a long way to go. It would be several more years before the U.S. elected its first openly gay public officials, over a decade before Wisconsin became the first state to outlaw discrimination against LGBT people. After that, it was a lifetime of battles of addressing the AIDS crisis, of fighting Don't Ask, Don't Tell, of watching as state sodomy laws were slowly dismantled, as civil partnerships were made into law. In 2004, the now-retired Inspector Pine publicly apologized for the Stonewall raid as hope finally began to triumph over hate. But all that's a story for another time, a story in which the Stonewall Inn plays an important part, but not the starring role. But what about the Stonewall itself? After the events of June the 28th, 1969, the bar limped on for a few more months, but the writing was on the wall. Interestingly, it was the gay community that killed it off. New activist networks arranged boycotts due to the bar's mafia links. Fat Tony shut the place down that same October, and the stone wall vanished into memory. Well, for a time. After spending a couple of decades at a Chinese restaurant and other things that resolutely weren't a gay bar, the Stonewall finally reopened in the 1990s. Although it would briefly close again in the mid-2000s, its place in history was now assured. In 2000, the Stonewall was made into a National Historic Landmark. Sixteen years later, it was upgraded to a U.S. National Monument, the first LGBT-specific site in U.S. history to receive this honor. Today, the Stonewall Inn still stands, it still serves drinks, and it still describes itself as a gay bar, although we'd bet good money that most of its clientele are tourists, whether gay or straight. In many ways, though, it's not the building itself that is important. While it's great for a shrine to gay activist history to be still standing, the real legacy of the Stonewall Uprising isn't a handful of bricks and mortar. It's the millions of gay marriages that have been performed since 2005. It's the men and women who can walk down the street today hand in hand without getting abused. It's the gay and trans people who no longer need to hide in the closet, the bi people in hetero relationships who still proudly describe themselves as queer. And this, right here, is why the Stonewall needs to be remembered. Because we sometimes need reminding that things can change, that even the most marginalized can have their voices heard. The story of LGBT acceptance may still be being written, but it's comforting to think that no matter how long it becomes, there will always be room for the tale of the 28th of June, 1969, the day a revolution began. And I really hope you did enjoy this video. If you did, please do subscribe to this channel. Please do hit that like button. Also, if you'd like to support us in our mission to make content like this, please do support our fantastic sponsor, Raycon, who I will link to below. And thank you for watching.